Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com where you can find the entire back catalog of over 100 episodes about high-performance computing, research computing, and other topics. Again, I have Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Hey, Brock. How's it going? It's getting to be hot in the summer here. I don't know if it's hot up there in Michigan, but it's certainly hot here in Kentucky. Yeah, the uh, the humidity has been the issue here. It's like swimming outside sometimes. That you think it's hotter than it really is. Fantastic. Well, let's distract ourselves by talking about something interesting then. Okay. So today we're talking about uh, something that was actually on the proposed list for a long time, but we only reached out to them recently, um, about NetCDF. And we have um, Ward and Russ here with us to speak to us. So guys, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Okay, uh, this is Russ. I was one of the original authors, developers of NetCDF at Unidata uh, with a guy named Glenn Davis. And... um, he was tragically killed in an airplane accident in about 1999. So after that, I supported and maintained the NetCDF library and utilities for several years and, till, and developed a, um, a proposal with a uh, NCSA guy named Mike Folk to, to NASA to develop NetCDF4 and uh, recruited and hired some NetCDF development team members, including uh, Ward. And, and wrote some blog entries about NetCDF, and uh, I do, am passionate about it still. My Colorado license plate has been NetCDF for the last 10 years, which is one of the geekiest license plates anybody has. Great. Uh, this is Ward. Uh, I'm a computer scientist. Uh, I worked with Russ for several years uh, on NetCDF before his tragic retirement. Uh, <laughs> NetCDF has become a passion of mine. My background is uh, computer vision and machine learning. Uh, But my work with NetCDF here at Unidata uh, has been very interesting. It's uh, something that's easy to be passionate about. So what is NetCDF? Well, NetCDF was originally developed to kind of provide a standard interface between uh, data providers and data users uh, t- for scientific array-oriented data and metadata, and for portable uh, data that was machine-independent and platform in- or and application-independent. So, um, a simple view is it's a file format and a data model and some APIs and freely available software that implement the APIs. So you can read and write NetCDF data, and together those support the creation, access, and sharing of scientific data. Um, there are some complications to that. Uh, there's lots of different APIs, and NFC has evolved over the over the three decades of use, so that it's now actually um, got some variants. But users usually don't have to worry about all those complications because of version compatibility and transparency. We've always developed um, NetCDF to keep to keep it backward compatible. Um, with previously written data and previously written programs so that when new so, uh, new versions are released, uh, things don't break. Um, and so I think, uh, well, let me just mention a few of the APIs that, uh, language APIs that support NetCDF access, uh, originally C and Fortran and then C++ and Java and, uh, more recently, Python, and then there's also R and MATLAB and Ruby interfaces, and there's lots of third-party software and utilities that's that can sit on top of NetCDF for data analysis and visualization and management. So, what does the CDF part stand for in the name? Okay, well, the whole thing is Network Common Data Form. It was not really format because we weren't really extra emphasizing the format. We were emphasizing. Uh, the API originally, we wanted to be able to change the format underneath without people having to change their programs, but we wanted to still support all previous versions of the format. But uh, people often call the uh, uh, CDF common data format. And actually, there was an original uh, software from NASA uh, mm-hmm. called CDF, and their, theirs really did stand for the common data format. And we uh, met with them and used some some good ideas. What they had was was a Fortran only uh, library that only was meant for VAX and BMS machines, 
and we thought the, there were such good ideas in that that we wanted to extend it to C and make it um, um, portable for other machines and also create a single file format for it because the original NASA CDF was a multiple file f- format to, to store multiple variables in different files. So, th- so, th- so that's where it originally came from. Now, you mentioned network is part of the name there, but in the same breath, you also say files. So which is it, or is it both? It's really both. Um, file, files are containers for NetCDF objects that are real sim- simple variables, multidimensional variables with their dimensions and some attributes. But um, the network, first of all, means that there is a network format uh, originally based on Sun's external data representation, XDR, so that you can access uh, data, the same data, um, on a network uh, with machines that have different architectures and different ways of storing um, numerical and text data. And also, there's uh, remote access to uh, NetCDF data using what's called OpenDAP protocols, uh, Open Data Access Protocol. Uh, that's been developed quite extensively. Uh, with NetCDF so that um, you can access data out of huge archives remotely, small amounts of large data sets efficiently through uh, OpenDAP uh, protocol requests. That's all underneath the API, so it's really no different than accessing data on your local machine, except you give a URL instead of a file name. So NetCDF is probably best and well known in the climate and other earth sciences community. How did that, what historical artifact existed that caused that to come about? Well, I'm in the historical artifact guy, so I'll take this <laughs> question too. Um, when it was first released, it became an ad hoc standard for sharing um, scientific data and metadata among modelers in climate, ocean, and atmospheric science communities because it was at the right level for for representing that kind of data. Uh, it had simple abstractions for variables and dimensions and attributes. And those three things were very important uh, because you a, a variable like temperature on a three-dimensional grid and dimensions like latitude and longitude and time and attributes like what units are the data in were natural abstractions for um, the output of data models and for Earth science uh, data. So it was a good fit to represent uh, multiple variables on shared grids and even uh, had the right abstractions to represent shared coordinate systems. Uh, There were other reasons for its popularity then. Uh, Mostly these things were written in Fortran, these early models, and C was was becoming more popular. But, um, you know, these Fortran and C users uh, didn't, we're, we're seeing the disadvantage of using Fortran I.O. or byte-oriented C libraries to, to write scientific data because uh, it made their data not portable uh, across platforms and languages. And NetCDF just provided an efficient, portable, language-independent I.O. APIs for Fortran and C users. Um, and it had some other de- you know, desirable properties, too. The data was self-describing. It, all, it had metadata about the data in it, uh, the file included ways to represent metadata. Of course, it was portable, it was scalable, which means that a small subset of a large data set could be accessed efficiently. You didn't have to read through all the preceding data. Um, you could append data to to a NetCDF file without copying the, the data set or redefining its structure, so that was efficient, adding a little bit of data to a big data file. Um, it was remotely accessible, as I've mentioned, through these OpenDAP protocols. And this guarantee of, of uh, compatibility with backward versions of the software made it a good thing for thinking about keeping archives of data. So I think those those were the most important things. Later on, there was this development called CF conventions uh, for NetCDF metadata that became an international standard for representing uh, metadata in the uh, output of models and forecast models and simulation models. So that was also very important. Okay, so what exactly then is the relationship uh, between Unidata and UCAR and NetCDF? What was the cross-pollination there? Uh, so I'll jump in and answer this one. So uh, UCAR, 
uh, is the uh, managing organization for the National Center of Atmosphere Atmospheric Research, uh, UCAR being the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. Uh, UCAR maintains several community programs, uh, the UCP programs, of which Unidata is one, and we have uh, several other sister organizations, uh, all of whom support science and scientists in our community uh, in our particular ways. Uh, so Unidata is uh, primarily supports the community through uh, development and maintenance of open source software, uh, NetCDF being uh, the most prominent software package uh, that, that, that uh, Unidata maintains. Yeah, let me just add that that Unidata has been around for about 40 years, or 30 years, sorry, providing data, software tools, and support to this community of the Unidata community, which is a bunch of universities also. Okay, let's get into the technology a little bit, and I'll jump right into the probably maybe a little bit controversial one, which is you mentioned backwards compatibility, but then there's um, NetCDF, Four and its relationship with HDF5. Can you talk a little bit about what the thought process there was and what you're trying to do there? Uh, NetCDF4 adds some of the features of HDF5 uh, in a backward compatible way because uh, it's a layer on top of HDF5 that also supports the previous versions of the format before HDF5 was used uh, through APIs that simply have extensions. There's no there's no incompatibility with previous versions. Uh, basically, we saw that HDF5 from Illinois had developed several advanced features uh, like compression and and data chunking, and we really wanted those. And so we didn't we didn't really want to develop yet another format. We thought, well, why don't we try to make try to kind of do a merger of NetCDF and HDF5 by adding some more APIs and, and using their storage layer underneath, and that way we could get some of the advantages of HDF5 without creating yet another format and all the all the work that would involve, and and it sort of worked. I mean, we we had HDF5 group worked with us, and they had to add a few things uh, that weren't there, and uh, we had to represent some some things that weren't there with uh, kind of artifices that were built on top of HDF5, but the, the result was uh, pretty successful. It, the NetCDF4 preserves the, the common characteristics of those two formats and mm. takes advantage of the, you know, the widespread use and simplicity of NetCDF and the performance and generality of HDF5. Yeah, I, I would add that in my experience, the, uh, the NetCDF4 uh, it refers to the enhanced data model and enhanced file format. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that NetCDF3 has been deprecated or has gone away at all. Uh, NetCDF3 is now the uh, referred to as the classic file format and classic data model uh, and is still actively maintained and developed. Uh, so the numeric naming convention uh, can occasionally be a little misleading, I've found. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think they're actually about equally popular now, even though it's been 10 years since we developed NetCDF4. NetCDF3 is still very popular. So given a lot of the functionality exists in HDF5, um, why would someone choose using NetCDF versus using HDF5 directly? Very good question. That uh, basically, many users of NetCF4 think that its data model and programming interface are simpler. So it makes using NetCDF and programs shorter and easier to understand than the equivalent HDF5 programs. And that's not because uh, it does exactly the same thing as HDF5, uh, but has better interfaces. It's because there's this trade-off between simplicity and, and power. And NetCF4 intentionally doesn't implement all of HDF5's uh, complexity and power, but only a subset of the most important features. But but there is another important difference. That's not the only thing that is simpler and easier to understand. It's uh, 
It's, it's NetCF's support for named shared dimensions. This is an abstraction which was never part of the HDF5 data model. And so NetCF variables that share a set of dimensions have this way to represent a shared grid or a shared coordinate system that's, um, that's not anything that's naturally provided in HDF5. HDF5 is more serves as a container for all kinds of things and doesn't have the conventions for for representing shared shared grids or shared coordinate systems. So um, that's responsible for probably one reason people use NetCDF4 or even NetCDF3 instead of HDF5 when they when they want that capability and they want as, as simple an interface as possible and they don't need all the stuff that HDF5 has. Uh, to add to that answer, um, the other thing that the HDF, HDF5 library is lacking is the ironclad backwards compatibility uh, or a, a archiving promise where we will never release, uh, you know, NetCDF will never release a version uh, that cannot read uh, data written by old versions of the library. Um, and that is not a promise you get uh, if you're if you are using HDF5 directly. Um, and in fact, we encountered something along these lines. Uh, I want to say to the middle of late last year with HDF5, where we the the uh, two current NetCDF developers had to scramble to to mitigate some changes in the HDF5 library, which would have potentially broken backwards compatibility. Uh, that that was our highest priority for for several weeks uh, working around this change. So in addition to everything Russ said, uh, this NetCDF provides this uh, promise uh, uh, to give scientists uh, confidence in archiving their data in NetCDF directly. Okay, so just to put that completely plainly, um, if I download NetCDF today and install it on some modern OS uh, with a modern application, whatever, I can read uh, with that one installation of NetCDF uh, data sets that were written 10, 15 years ago with NetCDF version one. Is that yeah, a correct statement? Absolutely. Okay. It's, okay cool. it's not just that you can read the same data. It's that if you have old programs that, uh, that created or read that data, uh, they will also work it, although you may have to recompile them and relink to the new library uh, to to uh, keep them working, sometimes they'll they'll work without. I mean, if it's formats changed underneath, you definitely have to relink to the new library, but you don't have to change a, a character of the program. All right, let me go in a slightly different direction here. Um, being an MPI guy, I have an MPI-related question for you here. Um, there is a project out there called Parallel Net CDF or P Net CDF. Um, mm -hmm. But there's also an MPI-enabled version of NetCDF. Is there what, – what's the correlation between the two? So uh, I'll jump in with PNetCDF if that's okay, Russ. Sure. Uh, so, so Parallel NetCDF is uh, an independent third-party project uh, maintained as a collaboration between Northwestern University and Argonne National Lab. Uh, and it works with NetCDF3, uh, 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 the – classic library and data model and file format. Uh, and it provides parallel I.O., uh, which was not native to uh, the NetCDF3 code. So I assume you mean the uh, uh, native MPI with NetCDF and uh, uh, parallel libhdf5. So uh, when, lib when the uh, HDF5 library has been built with uh, parallel I.O. enabled, um, the NetCDF library at configure time uh, before compilation uh, will actually probe your uh, uh, HDF5 library to see if it contains the parallel I.O. Uh, uh, operators. And if so, parallel I.O. is just enabled and available through NetCDF, uh, your, which, which is great because it lets your program, which relies on NetCDF, uh, achieve parallel I.O., without really having to change your code. Uh, it is just inherent, it, it, it's used automatically because the underlying uh, libhdf5 IO is parallel enabled. 
Okay, so this is MPI underneath the covers to affect the parallelism. What about the other way around? Has anybody done the MPIO APIs with NetCDF underneath? Not that I know of. Uh, same here. Uh, not that I've heard. I think MPI is kind of a lower level library than NetCDF. It doesn't uh, it, it doesn't deal with abstractions like variables and dimensions and attributes. And uh, so I'm not sure an MPI program could make that great a use of NetCDF underneath. So a file format's only as good as the ecosystem that can read it. What are some of the other common tools people use with NetCDF going from their simulation code to their visualization to archiving? You know, what are common tools that understand NetCDF that uh, people use? I'll take a stab at this. The, um, the library from the software that comes from Unidata comes with three important generic tools that have lots of uses by themselves for conversions and extractions. These are called uh, NC dump, NC gen, and NC copy. But uh, there's lots of other tools, as you can guess from a format that's been around for this long. Um, in, if you look up NetCF software on the web, there's the list of, I think it's over 80 freely available packages now that have been adapted to access NetCF data and visualize and analyze and manage it. And there's some commercial packages too. There's about 25 or so licensed packages that use it. And that's that's really too many for new users to have to choose from. But um, they're, they can look at the descriptions and try to figure out what might be useful. But there's, some, there's a few large third-party collections of tools that are especially suited to NCO. And I'll just name those now. NCO, which are the NCDF operators from... Charlie Zender and his group at uh, UC Irvine. NCL, which is the NCAR command language. It's a bunch of uh, really good graphics and analysis tools and a kind of a interpreter language that uh, that deals with the variables and su such, NCF variables. And then there's one called CDO, which is the climate data operators from uh, a group at the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology in Germany. And they each have their own particular strengths and a large collection of users. So it's hard to um, say much more about them. You'd have to, have to use them to see what, or look at them more carefully to see which one's most suitable. Uh, there's lots of other single app applications for doing browsing of NetCDF data. And, and NASA has, has some packages that uh, are very good general uh, mapping and analysis packages. That's about all I want to say right now about that. Uh, well, I, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I would also say just from uh, talking with our users and community members, uh, you know, for non-developers, uh, people who, who just want to work with NetCDF data, uh, the big three uh, packages, uh, company out of California, Esri, has software that is commonly used for visualizing data uh, stored in stored in that CDF format. Uh, MATLAB is another commercial software we get a lot of uh, questions about or just that comes up in conversation. But then also free tools like R and Python, uh, both of which have uh, NetCDF hooks, as well as the uh, inherent visualization uh, capabilities of those languages are also very broadly used. But as Russ said, we maintain a list of just dozens and dozens of commercial and open source packages that speak NetCDF. Yeah, and, and you're mentioning that Python. I have to throw in one more thing here too, because Py Python's uh, model for multidimensional data it is well, uh, is very compatible with NetCDF data. And, and this package, in Python called X-Array, X-A-R-R-A-Y, X-Array, developed by Stephen, Stephen Hoyer, is an open source project that, um, that really brings the power of uh, Pandas uh, using NetCDF data. Pandas is, a, is another popular package in, in Python. It provides n-dimensional uh, variants of the core Pandas data structures, and, and in member, it provides in-memory representations for NetCDF files. So uh, it's really quite uh, 
quite a good package to look at if you're going to be doing your programming in Python and you want NetCDF access. Well, so that brings up a, a related question here. You listed off a, a whole laundry list of languages uh, that the NetCDF APIs are available in. How did you uh, go through the typical quandary of exposing functionality in different languages? Are the bindings as close to identical in each of the languages, or did you take an effort to, you know, like support Pythonic things in Python and uh, C things in C and, you know, try to emphasize the strengths of the particular languages? And could you cite an example? Well, for the modern interface, uh, so for the modern interfaces, the modern API bindings, um, Unidata maintains three directly, the core C library, then the Fortran and C++ uh, APIs, uh, which are just separate libraries with hooks back into the, the core C library. Um, we also help maintain uh, the Python bindings, though that is not a project uh, we spun up from scratch. Uh, all the other languages, uh, of which there are many, like R, as previously mentioned, um, Ruby, uh, Perl, if you like, uh, any number of other languages actually come from the community. These are thing; these are bindings that we had zero involvement with creating. And for the most part, they exploit the uh, features of the languages in which, uh, for which they're intended. So that we don't try to make everything look like the C interface. Uh, we originally tried to do that with a Fortran 77 interface, but later on, for example, when Fortran 90 came along, um, there, a, an ex, a user contributed a binding there that really exploited um, features of Fortran 90 that weren't available and, and was much more comfortable for Fortran 90 users. And similarly, the Java interface and the the mental model you need to use it is quite different from the C, Fortran, or Python interfaces and is very Javonic, if you want. <laughs> it's not like Pythonic. It's, it's, uh, it, it was written by a, a sophisticated Java user, and so uh, it n knows about the idioms of that, the language and the way you represent things. I should also apologize to the Java team for forgetting that the Java bindings are also maintained internally. Right. So what's coming in the future for NetCDF? Okay. Uh, unless Russ wants to jump in, I'll answer this. I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, right now, uh, the, the next step that we're looking at uh, in the short term is extending uh, the compression capabilities. Uh, currently, we we leverage uh, ZLib through HDF5 uh, to achieve per variable compression uh, in the NetCDF enhanced file format. Uh, but uh, libHDF5 provides a uh, an interface for for adding in additional uh, uh, compression plugins, so to speak. Uh, uh, my colleague, Dennis Heimbigner, has written uh, uh, an API uh, that will let us leverage this. Uh, and we're also designing some experiments uh, to provide uh, uh, compression results to our community so that they can kind of see uh, what they can achieve with different compression schemes. Uh, beyond that, uh, with cloud computing having exploded the way that it has, uh, block storage is something we would like to be able to leverage with NetCDF to be able to uh, read from and write directly to block storage, uh, such as that provided by Amazon and other cloud providers. Uh, and beyond that, uh, largely we will be responding to the needs of our users because that is uh, our user commu community is who we serve and what they need is is we try to get there uh, at least before or at the same time as, as them. I guess I'd also say, uh, see the NetCDF GitHub site. Um, I think NetCDF uh, jumped on GitHub uh, sooner than HDF5, for example. I, don't, I think they still may not use it, but there are so many good uh, developments and going on there and so many users who have uh, been contributing that uh, mm -hmm. the 
the future uh, is somewhat being driven by um, what, what's what people contribute and uh, what, how it proves to be useful and how popular it is. So uh, I think there are some plans out there. Pull requests are welcome and encouraged and any reasonable feature that is pitched and implemented and submitted via pull request will be given uh, uh, full consideration. Let me ask you another forward-looking question, which uh, you, you may or may not have answers to, but uh, what do advances in hardware mean for you? So faster CPUs, uh, the advent of uh, SSDs, you know, faster access to storage, uh, faster networks, um, you know, do you use native network APIs, all these kinds of things that give acceleration possibilities um, to the underlying hardware? Are they opportunities to use that in the in your implementation well uh currently uh you know the 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 faster the underlying storage is to access uh the quicker the api that the library can can retrieve data uh locally um if we are talking about uh, uh data stored remotely uh via uh, and accessing it via open DAP, the open DAP api uh, advances in network speeds and, uh, uh, you know, the underlying technologies and hardware there, we will see in, uh, we will see better throughput. Uh, NetCDF, the NetCDF library is a storage medium. Uh, it's not an analysis medium. Um, there's, there aren't any operations to go, you know, uh, uh, for example, request a matrix decomposition on data stored in that CDF. Uh, and and because it's really uh, primarily just file I.O. and a data model, um, there's nothing for uh, increased CPU speeds or, you know, GPU accelerated uh, programming. There's nothing for it to really do that would benefit in that CDF at this point. I would say... Uh point out, though, that the SSD um, availability is actually uh, kind of important if you're using, if you're doing compression and chunking and that oh, sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Because when you rechunk, if data is written in a certain order and you want to commonly, most commonly have people read it in a different order, um, and, and there are huge data sets, for example, you have something that's, that's stored with all the data at each time, and you actually, the users actually want to take out time series at each point. Uh, it's uh, it's often that's about the worst case for uh, accessing data that was written one way and you want to read it in a different way. And SSDs turn out to be very helpful for that rechunking of data to try to get it into a way that's that's not really really fast in one direction in one order and really really slow in another order, but that is kind of uh, pretty fast for any way you want to access it in along any dimension. So so I, I wrote a blog about um, some experiments with SSDs and how they could improve um, very, they could, you could create huge improvements uh, by rechunking your data and the best way to rechunk it if you knew how it was going to be accessed was to use SSDs rather than uh, spinning disk uh, just because uh, you get much better performance for the kinds of things you need for rechunking. Uh, if you have lots of memory and you have SSDs, but that's about as far as, as uh, we went with that. So, what about licensing? Uh, what license is this library distributed under? So, I'll let you answer that one, Russ, for historic okay. purposes, and then uh, because and and then I'll have something to add. Sure. Okay. So Unidata uh, NetCDF software from the start uh, was NetCDFC and Fortran and Java interfaces were under a simple MIT style license. Uh, we actually wanted um, commercial applications to be written with um, NetCDF just to support it as an ad hoc standard. And so we didn't really want to put any restrictions on its commercial use uh, it, it should just be open source, and that's the sort of thing that MIT style license uh, gave us for, for open source. Later on, there were some um, some issues about whether to uh, use a GNU uh, library license, uh, various versions of that, and I think NetCDF Java, for example, 
is available under multiple licenses, including the uh, Lib GNU license uh, and the MIT style license. Okay, uh, so adding to that, um, so yeah, Net, NetCDF, as Russ described, is currently licensed uh, open source in the sense anyone can use it for anything, uh, which is how we would like that to be. And that is how many other unit data pro products uh, and projects are licensed as well. Um, there has recently in the last 12 months been a push to adopt one of the big licenses, one of the more uh, commonly known licenses, like a BSD three clause license instead of what we have now, which is effectively a BSD three clause license. Um, but whatever the license changes to, uh, the spirit will remain the same. Uh, it will be free to use for anybody, be it commercial or open soft projects, uh, with really no limitations on how anyone uses it. Yeah, I guess an Apache license was another consideration, which I'd forgotten about, too, because of uh, the patenting issues. But uh, we we don't think there's any patenting issues with NetCDF. And and uh, so we, as far as I know, decided not to use any of those Apache licenses. Yeah. All right, going in a slightly different direction again here. Um, what's the largest data set that you have heard of that NetCDF is used for? So I sent an email out to our community mailing list uh, when uh, recently asking this very question. And the response I got was someone who had a uh, single single digit petabytes. It was uh, two or three petabytes of data stored in that CDF. I think that was even single files that were stored in that were that were several petabytes, oh. right? It was yes. Uh, because there are archives, like for example, the uh, IPCC uh, climate data uh, is is uh, multi petabytes, I believe, from the fifth IPCC report. But but that's stored in millions of files. It's not all right. just one one unit. So this this person was was uh, just having a single container for petabytes. <laughs> Uh, yes, I was impressed, but that is uh, that is correct, Russ. It was a, in a single file. And then uh, uh, an offshoot of that question that we like to ask a lot of our, our guests here, too, is what is the strangest or the most unexpected use of your software that you've seen? Something that <laughs> when someone tells you that they're doing it, they're like, well, okay, wow, we, we never thought that would be a use case. Um, I have an answer for this, but I'm, I'm curious if Russ has one as well because he's got the broader view. Well, I, I know that uh, Ed Hartnett, who was one of our developers, always used to uh, claim – and so did Rich Signal, actually, that they did their taxes in CDF because it was so convenient. Uh, but I'm sure that was a joke. <laughs> um, I, there is some uh, some some use of NetCDF in uh, in some standards for storing uh, what is it? Uh, some there's an instrument that does spectral analysis of chemicals, and they use uh, it has nothing to do with meteorology or climate. And the standard is based on that CDF, but I guess that's not very strange. Um, okay. So the uh, use case I'm thinking of is several years ago, we had a support email uh, from a gentleman who wanted to store all of his Linux system configuration data in that CDF and had some very good questions about that. Uh, and I was happy to help, uh, although he really never answered my question of why would you do that? But I'm that's n none of my business. I'm, I was happy to help him. In, in that same vein, there have been people who uh, became enamored of NetCDF and said, well, why do I need relational databases? I'll take my relational data and try to store it in NetCDF. And that really uh, kind of uh, contorts the data model and it's not NetCDF is not ideal necessarily for the kind of stuff you store uh, in relational databases. It doesn't follow that data model at all, and and you really have to um, uh, con contort things to do it to do that very well. I think generally, if something is well suited to relational database management system, uh, go ahead and use those. Or, uh, but but uh, 
for something that's closer to scientific data, observational data, or model data, uh, NetCDF might be the way to go. Okay, so you mentioned uh, before we started recording here that you were one of the original authors of of this package here. Could you give us like the two or three minute history of NetCDF? How did it come about and how has it gotten to where it is today? Sure. Uh, In 1988, uh, actually, we had some meetings among folks from NASA and the the CDF uh, format I may have mentioned, uh, and then uh, some people from the University of New Mexico who had developed something called Candace and, and, a, and a guy from a image processing uh, company, uh, all to talk about issues with developing something like CDF uh, that for Unix and for, um, for other languages. Anyway, the, out of the meeting came the desire to develop our own uh, software for this and, and not try to use the NASA stuff. And we had uh, support from the National Science Foundation, who were the primary funder of Unidata. So we just developed this in 1988, 1989, and that's when uh, the the NSDF version one came out in '89. It was beta version in '88, and that uh, g- gained a lot of prop- popularity um, until about. Uh, well, actually, all through the 2000s, we talked about. Um, getting together with the HDF5 folks, uh, but uh, we know, ne- and we were certainly uh, competing with each other and cooperating with each other, but uh, we still were two separate uh, developments. And then in uh, 2010, 2011, we thought of maybe making a proposal to, I'm sorry, I have to go back and change the dates. <laughs> In 2003, we actually got together with uh, the folks from NCSA that developed HDF5 and tried to submit a proposal to NASA to develop this kind of merger between NetCDF and HDF5 that would put the NetCDF simple layer on top of the HDF5 um, underneath as a storage layer. And uh, that was funded by NASA and it's a, it supported basically four years, three or four years of uh, development that never would have happened without that, uh, that grant, um, which involved work both from Unidata and from HDF folks. So we'd like to thank them. Uh, then there's just been so many contributions from the community of users, uh, everything from bug reports to uh, actual big code contributions like Fortran, the Fortran 90 or the Python uh, software, some of the other language uh, software. So we're very grateful that the community has, has provided so much of what NetCDF is and why it's still useful. Okay, well, thanks a lot again for your time, guys. Uh, where can people find out more information about NetCDF and get involved? Uh, well, a great place to start is at the Unidata webpage, uh, which which is unidata.ucar.edu. From there, uh, next, you can go to our GitHub page, which is github.com slash unidata slash netcdf dash c. And from that landing page, you can find links to uh, the Fortran C++, et cetera, other uh, landing pages, as well as a lot of information about uh, netcdf at the high level, the philosophy, and then the nitty-gritty API details. Uh, finally, through the Unidata webpage, we maintain several mailing lists. Uh, uh, and joining a mailing list or browsing through the 30 years or so of archives is a great way to find out more. Good. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks, guys. Thank you.